Welcome to my channel, I'm Scott, and in this video I am going to walk you through the process of valuing Alcoa stock by analyzing their financial statements and dissecting their financial ratios so we can determine if it's a buy or a sell. Alcoa is the world's eighth largest producer of aluminum. It is a vertically integrated aluminum company operating in all major aspects of the industry, including technology, mining, refining, smelting, fabricating, and recycling. In 2016, it split into two entities, Alcoa Corporation, which is engaged in the mining and manufacturing of raw aluminum, and Arconic, which processes aluminum and other metals. It has aluminum operations in the US, Canada, Brazil, Iceland, Norway, Spain, Saudi Arabia, and Australia. It has bauxite operations in Guinea, Saudi Arabia, Brazil, and Australia. Its alumina operations are in Spain, Brazil, Saudi Arabia, and Australia. Aluminum originates from bauxite. Bauxite is an ore typically found in the topsoil of various tropical regions. Once it's mined, aluminum within the bauxite ore is chemically extracted into alumina. Alumina is an aluminum oxide compound. Aluminum prices have been rising a lot the past year. The higher the aluminum prices are, the better for this company. Global production of aluminum is rising, although at a slower pace the past few years. China makes up a bulk of the production of aluminum. Demand for aluminum is high, especially with the push for most countries encouraging electric vehicles over traditional cars. EVs have a lot more aluminum in them than traditional combustion engine vehicles. Even companies like Coca-Cola are struggling with the aluminum shortage because that's what's used to make its cans. The company is headquartered in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, was founded in 1888, so it's been around a really long time. It can be found on the New York Stock Exchange, Mexican Bolsa, Deutsche Börse, London Stock Exchange, Vienna, and Euro TLX. Let's get started with the model. This is a mid-cap company, 8.8 .8 billion market cap. They're trading at $47 a share, and they have 187 million shares outstanding. Let's look at their financials. The way you value a company is you estimate the free cash flows into the future, and then you discount those numbers back to today's value. That's what we're doing in this video. And free cash flow is cash flow from operations minus capital expenditures. So they do have positive free cash flow in 18, 19, and 20, but negative in the trailing 12 months. Net income is the profit or loss on the income statement. It's revenue minus expenses. And that's positive in 18 and the trailing 12 months, negative in 19 and 20. Revenue is a sales for the company. And that was pretty high in 2018. Then it's dropped a lot to 10 and a half billion in the trailing 12 months. It's not much of a mystery why their revenue was high in 2018 and low in 2020. Because aluminum prices peaked in 2018, so revenue was high. And then it's been coming down in 2019 and 2020. It's starting an uptick in 2021. So I do expect their revenue to grow a lot because I think demand will continue being high in 2021 and 2022. This is the company's income statement. The top line is the revenue of the sales. Here's a breakdown of their revenue from 2018, 2019, and 2020. Primary aluminum is 5.2 billion of revenue, then 2.6 billion of alumina, 1.1 billion of flat rolled aluminum, 238 million from bauxite, 141 million from energy. All these numbers have been going down since 2018 because the prices of aluminum have been going down. So companies that use primary aluminum are construction companies or transportation companies. So a home builder will buy primary aluminum. Flat rolled aluminum comes in metal sheets. So a company like Coca-Cola would buy flat rolled aluminum. Here's their revenue broken up by country. 4.2 billion in the US, 2.8 billion in Spain, 1.9 billion in Australia, and 346 million in Brazil. And of course, these numbers are going down each year because the prices are going down. Below revenue is the cost of revenue. These are the cost of goods sold for this company. This is payroll for its employees or the cost to produce the aluminum or bauxite or other metal they're producing. Revenue minus cost of revenue gives you your gross profit. And that was highest in 2018 because they had their highest revenue. It's $2 billion in the trailing 12 months. Then below that is operating expenses. $200 million is for payroll. Then they have other operating expenses of $677 million. So they do have positive operating income each year, which is a good sign. The trailing 12 month number is a lot higher than 2020 and 2019. They paid about 200 million of interest on their debt. And the bottom line of the income statement is their net income, which was positive in the trailing 12 months, a big negative in 2019. That's mainly due to this negative 1 billion in other income and expenses. They had a $446 million loss on divestitures. This is when you sell part of your business, like a subsidiary or a division. 
And the reason you're selling that part of the business is to benefit the parent company. That's called a divestiture. Another example of a divestiture is when you spin off a company. Like recently, Merck spun off Organon. They also have 225 million of asset impairments. These are all non-cash items. I would mainly focus on operating income when I look at the income statement. And the stuff and other income and expenses is non-recurring, so it's not going to happen every year, and it's not part of your core operations. This is their statement of cash flows. The top line is operating cash flow. That's how much cash the company generates from its operational business. You can think of operating cash flow as net income converted to cash because net income is your accounting profit or loss. It's not actual cash. So their operating cash flow in the trailing 12 months isn't that high. It's only $116 million. That's surprising. It peaked in 2019 at close to $700 million. I do expect their operating cash flow to grow a lot more the rest of this year and into 2022. They did pass through a lot of non-cash gains in the trailing 12 months. That negatively affects operating cash flow. They spend about three to $400 million a year on CapEx. Operating cash flow minus CapEx gives you your free cash flow. And that's positive every year except the trailing 12 months. They are using debt to fund some of their operations. They issued $516 million in 2018 and paid down $135 million. So they added $425 million of debt in 2018. They added $700 million in 2020 and $450 million in the trailing 12 months. This is the company's equity section of their balance sheet. They have $3.8 billion of equity. They raised $9.7 billion from issuing stock. And they've lost $241 million from running their business. So I'm pretty confident they're going to have positive retained earnings next year. They have negative $5.7 billion in accumulated other comprehensive income. That's a good number to keep an eye on because that can affect net income in the future. These are unrealized losses of $5.7 billion. It's mainly related to their pension plan. When you invest in a company that has a long history that pays a pension, they have a lot of people who are retired collecting money from the company. So it could really drain a company's operations. And I've seen companies get forced into bankruptcy from their pension plans. But hopefully this $5.7 billion will be spread out over many years. And they do bring in a good amount of revenue, so that should be able to cover those expenses. Let's look at the capital structure. 3.7 billion of equity, 2.2 billion of debt. They're 63% equity, 37% debt. And their net debt is 565 million, so they can pay off a lot of the debt with the cash on their balance sheet. Their weighted average cost of capital is 7.3%, and that's a discount rate we're gonna apply to the future cash flows. We estimated four years of future free cash flows. We also estimated the terminal value, which is all cash flows past year four. That's $12.8 billion. We discounted those numbers back to today using the weighted average cost capital. We get a value of the company of $11 billion. We divide that by 187 million shares. And we get a calculated stock price of $58. They're trading at $47. So they're trading at a 19% discount. It's a buy according to the model. The analyst forecast is for their revenue to grow only 1%. I don't agree with that number. I'm growing their revenue 5% in 2021. And I grew it 5% from the trailing 12 months because I think their revenue will be a lot higher with the higher aluminum prices. Then I grew their revenue 4% into 2022, 3% into 2023, and 2% into 2024. So I think that's a pretty conservative estimate. And the way I calculated their future free cash flows, I usually look at the revenue and see what percent of their revenue is converted into free cash flow. You can't look at that number in the trailing 12 months since they have negative free cash flow. And in 2018 and 2020, they have really low free cash flow. So in 2019, they converted about 3% of their revenue into free cash flow, which is pretty low. The average company converts 10% of their revenue into free cash flow. In 2022, I converted 3% of their revenue into free cash flow. In 2023, I converted 4%. In 2024, I converted 5% of their revenue into free cash flow. I only converted 1% of their revenue into free cash flow in 2021 because they do have negative free cash flow in the trailing 12 months. Simply Wall Street is way higher than me. They're at $83 a share. They're saying the stock is 43% undervalued. Six analysts priced this stock and the average price target was $50, which is pretty close to where they're trading at. This is where the stock has been trading since 85. It got pretty close to $100 at a couple of points, but during the 08 crash, the stock dropped a lot. It has come up and down since then, but it's still trading way below its pre-2008 highs. This is where the stock has been trading the last year. So you can see it's up over 200% from 12 months ago. And if you look at the price of aluminum, it probably has a similar pattern because this company's stock price is highly correlated to the price of aluminum. And this is a really volatile stock. It has a beta of 2.7, so it moves almost three times the market. It's up over 231% the past 52 weeks, while the S&P 500 is only up 36%. The 52-week low was 11, the high was 48. 
is trading pretty close to the high right now. And the stock is trading well above its 50 day and 200 day moving average. And this is a pretty popular stock. 7 million shares are traded each day. Pretty much all the shares outstanding are on float. 79% are held by institutions and 6.5% of the shares on float are shorted. In the past year, this stock has done much better than its industry in the market, but in the past three years, it has struggled, only up 15%, its industry 79%, and the market 66%. Analysts are forecasting their earnings to grow 4%, but their industry to decrease 5%. I'm not sure what that's about. They're projecting their revenue to grow 1%, its industry only half a percent. If you invested $10,000 into this company 10 years ago, it would have been a really stressful ride. You would have been down, then up, then down, then up, then down, then up. It's nice owning a stock like Microsoft that goes up and continues going up. But owning a stock like this fills you with anxiety, all these ups and downs. The biggest shareholder is Vanguard at 8.8%, then BlackRock, Dimensional Fund, Fisher Investments, and Orbis Investment. Let's look at their financial ratios. They have a pretty good PE. It's better than the market median and average. They have a really good price to sales ratio. They're bringing a lot of sales relative to their market cap. And they have a good price to book of 2.3. They don't have any intangible assets on their balance sheet. So their growth is organic, which is the best growth. They have a really solid return on invested capital. They can cover their interest payments about six times. A really good ROE at 11.4%. A good current ratio at 1.6. And their quick ratio is close to 1%. They have 1.7 billion of cash on their balance sheet, 700 million of receivables, and 1.5 billion of inventory. So they did have negative free cash flow in the trailing 12 months, but they have 1.5 billion of working capital, and they don't pay a dividend. The last time they paid a dividend was in 2016. So they do seem to be well-funded. So to summarize, I have them trading at a 19% discount. If you want exposure to aluminum industry, this will be a great stock to buy. It's the biggest aluminum company in the United States, eighth biggest in the world. Plus, they've been around well over 100 years, so I don't think they're going anywhere. Their financials aren't the greatest, but I think over the next few years, their numbers should be really solid because I think the need for aluminum will keep growing. And if that's the case, this stock will obviously keep growing as well. I rank their free cash flows 1 out of 10, their revenue 6 out of 10, and their ratio 7 out of 10. So let me know what you think. Give this video a like, subscribe, or comment below. Also, if you'd like to get a custom valuation or just support the channel, you can become a member by clicking on the link in the description below. Thanks for watching.